Galatians chapter 1. Travel here with me if you would tonight. Galatians chapter 1. I'm going to read five verses that you are probably well acquainted with if you are in churches that preach the message of the cross. But I don't want it just to be circumstances that we learn about that happened uh, in Paul's day. I want us to apply it to this group here tonight because it certainly does. The, the word of God is timeless. It is endless. And the situations that occurred even some 2,000 years ago are still occurring tonight, still occurring today. Amen. And we need to steel ourselves, guard ourselves against being led away from truth because truth is the only thing that will change a heart. Right. Truth is the only thing that can change a life. Amen. And if we hold to the truth, then it will continue to do its wondrous work in us. If we let go of the truth, then we will deteriorate quite quickly. So there's a danger for all of us, no matter who we are, no matter what our names are, no matter how long we've been in this, that the potential of leaving the truth uh, exists. Let's take a look, please, at... Verses 6 through 10. Paul writes and he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And once again, I'll say it by way of introduction. In this world in which we live, the message of the cross, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, is always going to be challenged in your life one way or the other. Outside sources, other people, other processes, other means, other ways of trying to live for God, and even the inward doubts that we have ourselves, those shaky moments that we all have. Can I get an amen? amen? And we need to be secured, ladies and gentlemen, in this wonderful, wonderful gospel, a life-changing gospel. Amen. It's been almost 35 years now since I've met Jesus Christ. I was, you, as most of you know, a drunk and a drug addict. And two o'clock in the morning, I picked up a Bible and I started to read it. And the truth of the gospel, the real gospel, the life-changing gospel came into my heart and came into my life. And he's been working on me ever since. Amen. Amen. And I don't ever want that work to stop. Amen. And so I challenge myself tonight as well as you that we might never leave the true gospel. And I want to minister a word entitled or a message entitled, Leaving the True Gospel. Let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight for the opportunity to minister this word. I thank you for laying it on my heart for such a time as this. I pray as we have been asking all week, all day long today, that if there be one here that's sliding away, moving away, uh, going in a direction deliberately or unknowingly that that wrong direction would be stopped tonight Amen. through your word and by the moving and operation of your spirit. And if, Lord, there come a day that others are tempted or tried to move away, let this word return into their heart, into their mind. Bring it back to their remembrance that they might stand true for you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen and amen. If you are a student of the Bible, you understand the concept of the book of Galatians. It is the opponent to the gospel that is on display in this book. And I really honestly believe myself that this book was probably written about 47, 48 A.D., it would be Paul's first epistle, if that is an actual date, and scholars are divided on it. But I think it's so simply because 
this story that we have here, the events that are happening in the Galatian churches, are the ongoing battle that exists in Christendom today. It has never changed. It has never stopped. And so while Romans is the first instructive, full-bodied work explaining Christianity and its fullness, I feel that Galatians is the first battle. It's the first battleground, and honestly, the most important battleground for the believer. Paul and Barnabas, as most of you know, and you can read it in Acts 13 and 14, went on a journey, the first missionary journey we call it today, into the realm of Asia Minor. And they traveled, we don't know, some 18 months so over a period of time and established churches preaching the gospel. The gospel that God had opened up to the Apostle Paul. The gospel of grace. The gospel of faith. Not a gospel of law. Not a gospel of works. But a gospel of faith. Righteousness yeah. without the law was being manifested through the preaching of the gospel. And while most Jews struggled with that because of their relationship to the law, the Gentile world started to grab a hold of it because there was hope. Finally, there was something other than just live and die and it all ends there. They started to believe that there was a Savior that could save them. And even though they weren't directly connected to the Jewish life, they were now connected to the Word of God through this preaching little Jew from Tarsus that would come in and lay the foundation of what the gospel was and who Jesus was and what he died for. And men and women were getting saved and lives were being changed. In that journey, and you can read it yourself, uh, Paul paid a great price. Uh, and you'd think that, I mean, every place he went, uh, it seemed like he had great success. And following that success, great opposition. When you, when I come to Patterson, I expect, you know, that it's going to be a, a good service. I don't expect to get stoned on the way out of town. I, but, you know, that's happening to the Apostle Paul. And, and so for this period of time, they circle that area of Asia Minor and preach to the southern Galatian area and establish a series of churches and then they go back to their home base of Antioch. And Paul and Barnabas report this wondrous result of churches being established and men and women being saved. And they then again turn their attention to the church at Antioch and begin to teach there and preach there. And we don't know how it happened. We don't know because uh, we don't have the story. But we know that one day somehow Paul caught wind of a problem. A problem that uh, was devastating in his heart and his mind. And that was that men that didn't believe in his gospel were traveling the same circuitous route that he did on his first missionary journey and trying to persuade the new converts to live for God in a way other than what Paul had described to them, in a way other than the gospel. And of course, one of the things that you can be sure of is that when somebody tries to oppose somebody else's gospel, they don't just oppose their gospel. In most cases, they do a pretty hard task. They're pretty tough on that person themselves. And so these men that were trying to destroy Paul's message also tried to destroy his reputation. Ladies and gentlemen, don't believe everything you hear. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, be careful of the internet and all that information that you can pick up about everybody and anybody. Remember, what you put on Facebook isn't really most of the time what you are. It's your best picture. <laughs> Come on, somebody. You know, and it was taken 15 years ago, but who knows, right? Uh, to Facebook. But um, when someone tries to destroy the ministry's work or a minister's work, along with that, they try to destroy his reputation. And they did that. They said, oh, he's not really an apostle. And so Paul was hearing that this other voice, these other words, these other gospels, these other men had come in and were laying waste and hurting those people that he had really given his life to train, given his life to bring the gospel to. 
And so in a hurry, he sits down and writes Galatians, some of it in his own hand, which was not normal for Paul. And you can see in the first five verses how he, he opens it up. He says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ. See, he defends his apostleship before he even says, hello, this is Paul. There's an urgency here to correct. There's an urgency here to get to. But he catches himself and blesses them in verse 3 and in grace and peace to you. And even in the content of the first five verses, Paul the evangelist can't help it. He's got to preach the gospel. In verse 4 he talks about Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. And then in verse 1 he says, he's already said, God raised him from the dead. And then again in verse for, uh, and he is delivering us from this present evil world. Now, if you just put that all together, you got the gospel in, in less than five verses. I don't know if you ever noticed it, but the evangelist in him just couldn't, even though his reputation was on the line and his message was being attacked, he just had to say, this thing is all about Jesus, the Son of the living God who came to earth and died for our sin. But he didn't stay in the tomb. He rose from the dead. Yeah. And he did all that that we might be delivered from this present evil world. Let me tell you, the gospel is good news. I said the gospel is good news. And that's what I want to focus on. I want to have that in my life. The good news that Jesus Christ came to the earth. The Son of the living God died for my sin but didn't stay in the tomb early Sunday morning as they preach. He got up out of the tomb. Yes, Hallelujah. And when we understand the gospel message, we know we got up in him. Hallelujah. And he has and is, he has and is in the lives of all those that believe he is delivering us. I said he is delivering us. I haven't been totally delivered yet. Well, Brother Larson, what's wrong with you? Take none of your business. <laughs> but I got news for you. You haven't been totally delivered yet. But there is coming an hour and there is coming a day when the dead in Christ shall rise loose. And on that day, ladies and gentlemen, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more... Come, Lord Jesus. But until then, I'm being delivered. I'm being changed and glad of it. But I have to know how God works in our heart and how God works in our life. That's being a Christian, and, I, and I've been telling our students this, and they're going to hear things that I've been saying all this week because it just hit me so strongly. Some people that think, think that going to church is really all there is to being a Christian, but even if you went to church five times a week in two service, two hour services, which our students do, two chapel services, three church services in a week, that's five services, there's 168 hours in a week. And even if your services were two hours, which I'm not going to keep you here two hours, now the Lord might, but I won't. Come on now. <laughs> But even if you spent 10 hours a week in church, you still have 158 hours to walk out this Christian experience outside the doors of this edifice or whatever church you belong to. Christianity is in that 158 hours. It's not just in here. In here you should be trained, strengthened, built. But this really hits the road when you walk out the door. 158 hours a week where you have to display, learn how to receive help to live this Christian life. It's not all about what happens in church. What happens in church should build me so that those other 158 hours or 160 hours or whatever it is, is actually something that puts Christ on display to everybody who knows me. And I'm learning and I'm growing. And it's not an easy thing. Because we were so lost and so fallen and so far down the scale. But when he picks us up, Amen. I said when he picks us up, he keeps picking us up. If we'll stay in tune with him. And that's why Paul is in a panic when he hears that his converts have, or have decided that maybe there's another way to being changed because he knows that there is no other way to change. And in verse 6, 
my first point. Paul says this, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I hate to report this to you tonight, but this is a truth. People are still quick to leave the gospel. Amen. And we don't always do it knowingly, but it happens. Paul says here, I am marvel. I am absolutely astounded. I am flabbergasted. I am blown away. I can't believe what I'm hearing. This is, this is Paul writing to his converts. And he says that you are so soon removed. You know, the, the term removed there actually indicates that there's someone that is uh, deserting, like a, a soldier, AWOL, not absent without leave, not on base, not where they need to be, when they need to be there. That you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. Who called you into this relationship with God? Who called you? Jesus. Who calls every sinner into relationship with God? Who calls you? Jesus. Who's the person of the Godhead that calls you? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit draws. He draws you to Christ. And after you accept Christ, he moves inside of you immediately. Now, I'm a Pentecostal, and I believe in a second subsequent work and an endowment of power for service. But don't get this wrong. The moment you get born again, the Holy Spirit moves inside of you, and because of your faith in Christ, begins immediately to transform you. You didn't have to know theology. You didn't have to know diddly. My four-year-old granddaughter sings a song now and quotes all the books of the Bible. I think most of us might have a problem, even if our life depended upon it, if we had to name Genesis all the way through Revelation in order. But she's got it. I mean, she's, I mean, she's, she's right there. But what I'm trying to say is there's a drawing of the Holy Spirit that happens at salvation, and then the Holy Spirit becomes your constant companion. He leads you and He guides you. If you start going off track, He gets all over you like white on rice, like dark on night. You can't get away with anything. If you try to talk to somebody just in a loud tone, all of a sudden there's something on the inside of you going, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Okay, anybody know what I'm talking about? And Paul says... He's so concerned because these people that he had spent his time and even at great price to himself brought into the kingdom have left off their relationship with the only one that continually is able to train them. He says, you have been so soon removed from him, from the Holy Spirit that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now think of that. If you lose contact, if you lose the help of the Holy Spirit in your growth process, growth is over. That's right. Because you don't do this thing on your own. You don't accomplish sanctification or progressive growth on your own. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit. It demands the power of the Holy Spirit. And when did they leave off Him? They didn't mean to, but they had been told some things that changed the object of their faith. Ladies and gentlemen, He says here that you have been called into the grace of of Christ. You weren't just saved by grace. You were called to live in grace. Yes. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for those three amens. I'm going to say it again. You weren't just called to experience grace and salvation. Grace is something you need every day. Grace is the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit only works within the confines of the finished work of Christ. In other words, because of what Christ did and your faith in it, the Holy Spirit has the legal right to work and labor in you. And if you don't believe in what Jesus has done, you're not depending upon him, then you're going to frustrate, cut yourself off from the helper that you have to have in order to grow. You won't, might not mean to, you might do it by mistake, or you might just say, oh, I'm sick of hearing about this cross, and off you go. Or there's another way, and off you go. Or there's another thing that somebody else is telling me, and I think I'll embrace <laughs> that, and off you go. And before you know it, you are 
removed from him that called you into a life of grace. Grace has a twin. Her name is faith. Faith begets grace. Grace always encourages faith. You've got to live the Christian life by faith and by grace. Ephesians 2 and 8 says, For by grace are you saved yes. through faith. Amen. For by grace are you saved through faith. And, and grace or saved there is the great word sozo. In the Greek, it means to be healed, to be protected, to be delivered. To be made whole. Let me say it again. To be healed. To be protected. To be delivered. To be made whole. You are being saved by faith and grace. By faith in Jesus and what he's done. And God's grace then heals, protects, delivers, makes us whole. Heals, protects, delivers. This is how he works. God I don't have to shout. Yes, I do. That's the only way God works. He works by faith and grace. Your part is faith. His part is grace. Giving us what we don't deserve, what we don't earn, what we don't labor, what we can't work for, what we can't deserve. God doesn't ever owe us anything. He says, open the door to your life by trusting in my son and what he's done. My daughter Grace last Wednesday preached, and when she did, she said something that I, I wish I could claim it. Now I am. Uh, I'm stealing it from her. She said she'd been in a struggle relative to the message of the cross, and God dealt with her. But one of the statements that she made was this. She said, if you leave off faith in the cross, then nothing in this book pertains to you. Amen. If you leave off faith in Jesus and what he did, there's nothing in this book that has anything to do with you. Because God's book is a book of salvation. It's a book of redemption. And the thing that brought about redemption and continual working of the Holy Spirit in us is what Jesus did for us at Calvary. It's what Jesus did on the cross. And if you don't accept what he did on the cross, this book has nothing to do with you. You can quote it, you can say you know it, you can say you love him, but if your faith isn't in Jesus and what he did, this book has nothing for you. It hasn't anything to do with you. You're not included in the plan of God. But let me take it to what she didn't say. If your faith is in Christ and what he's done, then everything in this book pertains to you. of God, all the blessings of God, all the opportunities that God can do in your life, they come because your faith is in Him. Don't you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that faith is really all we have to offer offer right. God? We don't have anything else to, to expend. We don't have anything else to offer. Hebrews 11 and 6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please Him. I want to please God. Therefore, I must keep my faith in His Son, His redemption plan. What He did to call Cause all of the promises of the book to be mine. Amen. Hmm. Yes. Okay, I feel better. <laughs> but people are so quick to leave the gospel. Yes. And and sometimes we don't even we don't see that we're doing it. We don't mean to be a traitor or a AWOL soldier. We don't mean to damage our relationship with the Holy Spirit. We don't mean to leave the way of faith and grace. Theologically, we in our minds say, well, I'm, I'm still all there. But the problem with those people in Paul's day is that they had embraced another gospel. And the word in the Greek is a, is a, it's a play on words. But it means one of a different kind. You've embraced another gospel. One of a different nature. It's not the same. It may have some of the same ingredients, but it's not the same. It may sound similar, but it's not the same. It's another gospel. Well, how in the world did they get there? Well, verse 7 tells us, There be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. 
Can I say to you tonight that false teachers are still up to the same old tricks? The false teachers and the false presenters of the gospel are still trying to come in. And, and in today's world, it's interesting because most people have never really heard the true gospel. Maybe for salvation, but hardly any for progressive sanctification and growth. Amen. Most people don't understand justification. And when we finally get somebody preaching justification, a lot of times they take it too far into unconditional eternal security or, oh, it doesn't matter how I live. The reason for justification, God's legal declaration of your innocence based on your faith and your faith alone exists so that when you fail you can get up knowing he hasn't thrown you away Amen. Thank you. you don't lose your salvation every time you fall you can only you lose your salvation if you lose your faith you don't get saved by what you do you can't lose it by what you do but if you embrace, on the other hand, a life of sin, it will ultimate, ultimately eat away at the fabric of your faith. Yeah. It'll destroy your faith. And one day you'll get up and say, I don't care, because your heart is hard because of the sin that you're living in. Amen. Yeah. So there is a danger. But I don't live in eternal insecurity this morning or this evening. I'm positive that what Jesus did for me yeah. has got brought me justification. But false teachers come in and they trouble people. What does it mean to trouble people? Well, think about it. You're a new convert or maybe one that's been around a while. And your relationship with God isn't going the way that you want. Maybe you're struggling in certain areas. Or maybe you've just been hiding those areas and nobody knows that they're there. Um, or maybe you're just frustrated because you can't ever rise above. I mean, uh, you've tried everything they told you to do. You, you went to all the places where there was supposedly revival. You had people lay hands on you. You confessed and confessed and confessed and confessed and you failed. And so you confessed to God. Then you confessed and you confessed. Okay. And... Somebody comes along and says, well, see, you're doing it wrong. You've had your faith in Christ, but it's, you can't just keep your faith in Christ. You've got to have, you got to do something. I do? Yeah, man, you've got to do something. Well, what is it? Well, it varies from false teacher to false teacher. <laughs> Invariably, it's something that you do, something you perform. And if you're a new convert and someone that is supposedly mature in the Lord or somebody that comes from Jerusalem, <laughs> a religious center, comes to you and says, ma'am, you've been doing it all wrong. You Believers have a love for God and Satan uses that love for God and desire to do for God. And he uses it as a lever, as a fulcrum, a lever, if you will, to ply them over into a works-orientated gospel. And, and because, you know, it feels good to do something. Mm -hmm. Brother Swigert likes to say it this way. It ministers to our sense of self-importance. <coughs> oh, yeah. Oh, thank God. I'm tired of Brother Larson's faith this and Brother Matt faith this and faith and grace. I mean, let me do something. Let me grip the donkey by the ears. Let me go get a hold of something and do something. I can tell you this is one boy. Don't, draw, don't try to grab the dog by the ears. You. <laughs> but doing something allows pride to enter. It, it gives me this feeling of self-importance. I'm doing now. And so it, there's an appeal of the false teacher that comes and says, well, it's good that you've accepted Christ, but now if you want victory, and then he gives you the spiel. 40 days of this, or 21 days of that, or 15 hours of this, or 15 hours of that. 
And a young convert that doesn't know better, doesn't want to disobey God, and surely the man that comes from Jerusalem or some <coughs> religious center, he's got all this PhD and <laughs> piled high and deep and you know, all those other things behind his name, surely I can trust him. And I want to do right for God. And the heart is troubled. And it's anxious. And it grows fearful. Well, now that the doctor so-and-so told me what to do, if I don't do it, I won't please him. And everybody else is going there, so I've got to do that too. I, you know. And we get anxious and we get troubled and we think, well, am I really what? And we lose sight of what brought us in. When you got saved, all you did was look up to heaven and said, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus, I can't. You can. Help. And ladies and gentlemen, theologically speaking, that's it. That's right. That's it. God today, after 35 years of being saved, I still can't. Yes. But you still can. See, that's the gospel. Acknowledging my need for His help. Not, I got this God, just watch what I do and bless me after I do it. <laughs> but it sounds good. And the, and the Judaizers, we call them that now, but the false teachers had come in and they said, you guys got to keep the law of Moses. You got to be circumcised and you got to go to all the feast days and you got to, you know, it's good that you, you know, Paul's an okay guy. He used to know this, but he's kind of moved away. Is there anybody in your life that's been troubling your faith in the cross? Is there anybody in your life that has tried to get you to move away from the simplicity of the gospel? Has your flesh said, oh good, finally something I get to do and present to God? Are you there? Have you been thinking that maybe this faith and grace path just takes too long and God needs my help. So I'll journey on this road that others are telling me I need to. Don't leave the true gospel. No matter how you're troubled. The Bible says that they were troubling these people that Paul had seen saved and they were, here it is, Look at verse 7. They would pervert or corrupt the gospel. When you add one thing to what Jesus did, you corrupt the purity of the gospel. Amen. When you tell God that you can do what needs to be done, you're ignoring the power of sin and the effects of the fall and the fact that it is impossible for you to accomplish what needs to be done. But we all get pulled in those directions. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul would say, beware. Same kind of situation. I don't have time to explain it. Beware lest any man spoil you. Colossians 2 and 8. Beware lest any man literally rob you of what you have and take you captive. Beware, lest any man, and it's generic, ladies, you're included in that. Amen. Any person, whether it's your wife or your spouse or a, a respected member of the clergy of your town or whoever it may be, beware, lest any man spoil you, rob you from what you have, the freedom and the liberty that you have in Christ. There's nothing better than being transformed by the power of God's grace. Yes, I know sometimes it takes a little time. That's not God's fault. That's just because we need a lot of work done. Uh, my, my, my wife and I are remodeling our home a little bit. And I say a little bit because every time I turn around the corner, they said, well, we found this, and then we found that, and then we found this. And, then... and I got to say, whoa, buddy, the price is getting too high. You know what? I'm glad Jesus paid it all. Amen. The refurbishing that I need in my being. Don't let any man rob you 
by pushing you to philosophy and vain deceit, traditions of men, rudiments of the world. Oh, it all looks good, it all sounds right, and it can have a lot of religion behind it, but the true believer is struggling to just keep their faith in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and receiving grace to help in, in their time of need. What's my time of need? My whole journey on earth. He said, come boldly Amen. to the throne of grace to get two things, mercy and grace to help in my time of need. One's my time of need right now Amen. all the time. Yes. And the only way I'm going to get that grace that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit is to keep my faith in Jesus and what He's done. That's right. Don't believe another Jesus and another gospel with another spirit. Oh, the words will sound okay, but it's not the simple gospel. If it's not faith in Christ and Him crucified, step away from it. And if you're thinking of, well, maybe I'll try that. You know, there, every now and then it, it would be kind of nice not to get hit every time I go somewhere else. Because it's, it's you know, I get the emails, you know, dear idiot. <laughs> oh, they must be writing for the swing. No, that's, that's their, you know. Here's another good one that really showed the endearment they had for me. Dear bootlicker. Oh, uh, that was interesting. Um, the world is not going to accept your gospel and religion is going to oppose. And we feel the pressure of that opposition. And wouldn't it be nice if you could just be more accepted? And wouldn't it be nice if all the family didn't argue about the church you went to and the Bible that you read with the red letters in the wrong place. <laughs> I'm heading home, aren't I? Sometimes we get weary of the opposition and the persecution and we just think, oh, it would be just, just a little trail of compromise, just a little give up on the idea just a little maybe not be so hard maybe you know brother matt ease up a little bit maybe we could invite you know our church would get bigger if we could just invite you know a few more people that didn't exactly think like you know we think that's good preach and we start thinking how wonderful that would be but it wouldn't be wonderful because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. We're right. thinking in our congregation, in our hearts, in our spirits, in our churches, Brother Joey. We've got to stay strong in what we believe. Amen. And here's the thing. You've got to learn how to get that strength just between you and the Lord. You've got to get that and bring it to the church. Now, I know some days you'll come and the church service will bless you and thank God it does because we need it. But primarily, this is between you and God. You are the only one that can direct the object of your faith and you're the only one that can fight the good fight and stay on the road. Amen. Don't let any man spoil you. Don't let the false teachers, the false propagators of the gospel today take you away from faith and grace. Thirdly, verses 8 and 9, and I'm about done. God still responds the same way to people that preach another gospel. He hasn't changed his mind. And Paul said this, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto, the, unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Anathema. Separated from God. Devoted to destruction. Eternally lost. I've not preached that hard against people who aren't preaching what they should be preaching. But that doesn't change God's view of it. That's right. 
God still is the same yesterday, today, and, and forever. And the cost and the price that he paid to bring to us the gospel, the true gospel, was his son. I don't know if you remember the, the story of Hosea and Gomer in chapter 3 of Hosea. I won't spend a lot of time there, but it's interesting to me just to show you the price God paid. Hosea in this book is a type of God, and sorry, Gomer is you and me. And Gomer was the unfaithful wife. God told Hosea as a sign to the nation to marry a, a wife that had an unfaithful character. And, you know, he's a man of God and he obeys the Lord. But I'm sure he was thinking, hey, this is going to work. This is good. This is, we can make this work. You know, God said to do it. Man, she's going to get saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. It's going to be good. And the first couple of years, things seemed to be good. And they had their first child. But by the time the second child came around, there's some evidence that it wasn't his. And by the time the third child came, God said, name that child, Lo Ami, no longer my people. Gomer just couldn't get the world out of her system. And so you can hear Hosea pleading with her. Don't go. Don't go. Stay here with me and the kids. Just stay here. But she just, bright lights in her eyes. She's got to move out of the house and chase after her lovers and her party boys. <coughs> so she does. And things go good, but you know, ladies, when you're 20, and you've got that Coca-Cola bottle figure, everybody wants you. But when you're 25 and used up, that Coca-Cola bottle starts moving towards a mayonnaise jar. <laughs> and after a while, Gomer had no more appeal. The luster of youth was gone. <coughs> For a woman that's not with her husband supporting her, she either needs income, lovers, or like she had, but when her beauty went, and sin destroys beauty fast. Amen. And she, she maybe, we don't know, and this is speculative, maybe she became a prostitute because she could at least make money for a while that way. But after a period of time, the body and the mind and it just... <coughs> No one's paying. And she ends up on the auction block of slavery where she's not even fit to be a not even fit to be a person that washes people's feet. Nobody wants her. She's put up for sale. God speaks to Hosea and he says, go buy back your wife. Go buy her back. Well, the price of the slave was 30 pieces of silver. Hosea looks around the house and he finds 15 pieces of silver, but he doesn't have any more money. Offerings haven't been very good. He looks in the cupboard and he sees some food, but the food is there for the kids. He'll, he's still raising three kids on his own, but God says, take the money you have, take all the food that you have, and go and buy her back. Empty your cupboard, empty your bank account, and buy her back. And so he travels to the auction block, and she's there, she probably sees him coming and thinks, oh, he's just come to mock me. He's come to make fun. And the bidding starts and nobody bids. And he comes a little bit closer. She knows the threadbare coat. He, she knows the walk. She knows the look. And he raises his hand and he says, I'll 
purchaser. He makes the purchase and the money and the goods are exchanged and he goes to Gomer and he says, I want you for my life. All I ask is that you be faithful to me and I'll take you back as my wife. My friend, that is a picture of what God Amen. did for me. He emptied the bank account and the cupboards of heaven and he sent his only begotten son. And all he asks is that I be faithful to him. And that I keep my faith in him. And I be as good as I can be. He doesn't ask me to be perfect. He knows better. He's going to work with me. But he asked me to be faithful. That's the picture. And when you look at God face to face and you say, I'm not going to be faithful in the plan that you have afforded, he says, anathema. Not just to the teachers, but to those who follow that teaching because he paid such a great price. Last thought, and I'll let you go home. Paul says this in verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? What's he, what's he talking about? He's really saying, do I seek to please men or do I seek to please God? Think about it. A false gospel will cause you to please men. But faith in his son will cause you to please God. And Paul says, if I'm worried about what everybody else thinks, and I do what I do just to please men, or because I'm afraid of what they're going to call me, oh yeah, you're just a swagger type. You're one of those SBN people. <laughs> I'm afraid of what they'll say. Will you please God? Or will you please men? If you want to please God, you're going to have to keep your faith in His Son, who He is and what He's done. And then you can qualify as a servant of Christ. There'll be a lot of pulls on us, ladies and gentlemen. This is not easy. There's sometimes a voice will be raised in objection to the path we're on. And sometimes it'll come from friends and family and people we love. And oh, wouldn't it just be easy if I just gave in, gave up, and gave out? But Paul says, all in all, I just want to serve Christ. That's what I want to do tonight. I want to serve Christ. I want to display a life that loves and shows appreciation for the price that God paid for my soul. And I want to pay attention to it the way that he's designed it. I want to be what God wants me to be. And the only way to do that is to make sure that I keep my faith in his son and learn more and more every day about what his son did so that everything in this book will pertain to me. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line, I am trusting in His love divine. Every promise in the book, it's mine. Amen. Every promise in the book, oh, it's mine. Every chapter, Every verse and every line. Oh, I'm trusting in His grace divine. Every promise in the book, it's mine. Amen? Amen. 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 Would you stand with me tonight? I want us to just simply have a moment of prayer and let you think about what has been said tonight. I, I wanted to challenge you, but not scold you. I wanted to encourage you, not deplete you. I wanted to add to you. 
I need you to see the importance of keeping your faith where it needs to be. Despite all obstacles, despite all opponents, despite all other opportunities to turn away, I'm trusting that you're going to stay true and not leave the true gospel. And that's what I want for your heart tonight. And there may be people here tonight that were struggling. You're not to be ashamed of the struggle. Temptation is not a sin. But giving in to the struggle, giving in to the temptation, that can be devastating to you. And I don't want that. I can't make it happen for you. You make it happen for yourself based on your faith and your trust and exhibiting your love back to Him. After He exhibited His love for you on Calvary. He did it on Calvary. So tonight I just want to pray that we would all stand strong. And I want you to join me. I want you to pray with me even in your own way. It's an open altar call without calling you to the altar. And if God has touched your heart tonight and you need to repent of moving away, well then do it. Do it between He and you. And if there's someone, something pulling at you to get away from that, well then ask God for grace to help in time of need because this is the most important choice that you'll ever make. It's what to place your faith in and how to live for God. And I want you strong. I've been excited to come down here all day long, all week, knowing I was going to preach this, that I thought there's going to be someone here that's been thinking about going the wrong way. And God is going to switch them tonight. Amen. And God is going to secure them tonight in the gospel ship. Amen?